The Lady Vols have a coaching search on their hands. Danny White has fired Kelly Harper, and now all eyes are on who's going to replace Kelly Harper in what will be uh, one of the most important moves of Danny White's tenure, certainly since he hired Josh Heupel at the beginning of his time as Tennessee's AD. Welcome into the Volunteer State. I'm Blake Topmeyer alongside the Knoxville News Sentinels, John Adams and Cora Hall. Of course, you know John, a regular on the pod. Cora covers the Lady Vols for the News Sentinel, also an AP Top 25 voter, knows women's basketball very, very well, and is covering this search for the News Sentinel over at knoxnews.com. So let's get into it. Today, we're going to pitch some candidates for this search. We got a few big name swing for the fences options. We've got lined up. We also got uh, a few fallback plans, maybe if those uh, big name options don't connect. But first, let's set the scene for this a little bit. When you look back at, at past Tennessee coaches since Pat Summit, they've gone in the family. Pat Summit disciples, first with Holly Warlick, then with Kelly Harper. Holly Warlick was, was fired by Philip Fulmer, replaced by Kelly Harper, and now Tennessee moving on from, from Kelly Harper. So before we get into candidates, I'm wondering from you both, let, let's start with this. How likely do you think it is that Tennessee will try to stay in the family this time and, and hire another former Summit disciple, someone who played for the Lady Vols? Or do you think the appetite is there um, to this time maybe go in a different direction and look outside the family for this hire? Go ahead, Cora. You're the expert on this search. <laughs> I think you kind of have to go outside of it this time just because, I mean, the last two didn't work out. And I think Danny White also has a less vested interest in staying in the family, more like less than Philip Fulmer, at least. Um, and it, it doesn't help that there isn't an obvious candidate who is a Lady Vols um, alumni. I mean, Kara Lawson obviously is, you know, has a promising start at Duke. I think it's just hard to sell that when, if you're making this decision now, if you're firing Kelly Harper right now, um, it feels like a lateral move in, in some ways, just because um, she's only been there for really three seasons because Duke opted out of the 2020, 2021 season. Um, she's been to the last two tournaments they made a run to the Sweet 16 this year, um, and then they lost um, to UConn. So I think for, if you're looking to really make a big splash with this hire, I don't know if she's the way you go. Um, she has had some success in recruiting, which is important, but um, with Kelly Harper making back-to-back -back runs to the Sweet 16, and if that is kind of the standard where it's not good enough, I just don't know if – picking a coach who doesn't have as many years under her belt and has only also reached the same um, achievement in the postseason is really the best way to go when the program is at such a pivotal moment as it is right now. Yeah, I think Kara Lawson would have had a better shot if Tennessee had never hired uh, a, a, pre, a former Lady Vol as its coach. Uh, I mean – I just don't think you could do it for that reason alone, because you've hired two really good uh, former Lady Vol point guards. You fired them both, and now you're going to hire a third? I don't know how you explain that at a press conference. Uh, and and I'm with Cora. I mean, she's she's done okay at Duke. Duke's had a lot of success through the years, and other coaches have recruited well there. And I, I I think it's a good place to recruit to for women's basketball. So I would just, I would eliminate her just kind of on that alone. I just don't know. I want to, I want somebody, I guess, either with a better resume or with kind of a wow factor. And I think to me, Kara Lawson would have been a more viable candidate the first time when she was a sort of a candidate and in uh, UT hired Kelly Harper, because you knew what Kelly Harper's track record was. Uh, you didn't know Carol Lawson had no track record of head coach. She'd been an assistant with the Celtics done very well on ESPN. She's very bright. Uh, so she had an, you didn't know what her upside was, I, but Kelly, I mean, she'd been fired at NC state that 
that was a pretty big red flag. So I, I just don't think you could go there. Yeah, it's it's interesting to hear you guys say this because I remember I I covered the twenty I guess it was twenty nineteen coaching search for the Lady Vols and 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 there was a very strong feeling at that time that it was going to be one of two people it was either going to be Kelly Harper or it was going to be Kara Lawson and and Philip Fulmer sort of hammered that home at the at the introductory press conference for Kelly Harper he said quite revealingly that he had a thought at one point during the search that maybe he would go outside the family, but he said you know, three administrators told him that it was essential that this hire had to come from the Lady Vols family. And, you know, that really sort of reduced the search, I think, to two realistic candidates at that time, Kelly Harper and, and Kara Lawson. And, and we know where, where Tennessee went with that. So it does seem like it would be kind of going back in time five years if they were to land on, on Kara Lawson, that doesn't seem like it's Danny White's style. It would go against every indicator we have on on Danny White, as as Cora was saying. And also, we, we, we just see this time and again with coaching searches. It doesn't really matter the sport. You always do the opposite of what you had before. You know, if it's football and you had a defensive-minded coach before, didn't work, you fire him and you bring in the offensive-minded coach. If you had a, um, you know, a coach that was old school uh, before, you the next coach is – quote unquote, new school that, I mean, it, it almost down the line, we see this time. And again, you always look for the opposite of, of what you had before. And maybe that's unfair to, to Kara Lawson, but it just sort of is the reality. So I, I agree with you all that I, I think, uh, I, I would be surprised if, uh, Kara Lawson is the, uh, is the landing spot here. Cor Cora, how big, how willing do you think the appetite is, I guess, in the fan base, supporters, boosters around the program that maybe this time Tennessee could go outside the family? Because I'm not sure. I don't think that appetite was there among Lady Vols fans five years ago. Um, I think most of them had hoped Tennessee would and, and did stay inside the family. Do you think that has has changed and, and maybe to what degree in the last few years? Yeah, that's a great question. I I don't know. I think it's probably there's people on both sides where – um, I know there is a lot of people who are talking about Kara Lawson and um, just because of the success she did have this year. Um, but I do think that there's a lot of people that are have, have the mindset of if you are going to fire Kelly, like you have to get somebody better. And I think that's true. Like, I think if you're going to make this decision now, like the person you hire has to be a surefire, better coach who is going to impact and move the needle immediately because otherwise I don't know why you made the decision now. So I think it's, it's kind of, if they're gonna do this and, and, you know, move on from Kelly, I think there's probably a lot of people with the feeling of we just need to get the best coach we possibly can. And it feels difficult to limit that to, you know, as much as maybe some people want to um, have a former Lady Vol, it's just like it's it's just a hard sell right now with the former Lady Vols as head coaches. Um, I think maybe down the line, Alex Simmons is a really interesting um, coach to consider. She's just so young right now and um, just finished her first season at Memphis. So, like, it's just so early in her career to even really consider that when the program's at the point it is right now. Um, but I do think down the road, like she's going to be a very interesting candidate for this job if it becomes open again, because I mean, she walked into Thompson Bowling Arena this season and almost upset Tennessee um, when Rakia Jackson, that was the first game Rakia Jackson was hurt. And they walked in forced overtime, um, played really, really hard. She coached a great game. Um, so she, she, I have no doubt will have success in her coaching career. So she could be a really interesting candidate down the line. But I just don't think right now it's as much as if you want it to happen, I don't think it's really an option. All right. So let's get into maybe some options. John, uh, John starts off here. Like I said, we're going to have some, some swing big candidates and, uh, a, a few fallback options as, as well. So John, get us going with your first swing big candidate for this coaching search. Okay, I'm going with Jeff Walls of Louisville. He wanted the job five years ago. Uh, I don't think Tennessee had any interest in him uh, to 
you know, I think as Cora pointed out and you did too, I mean, it wanted to hire somebody in the Lady Vols family. Uh, now that that's run its course, I don't think there would be the same objections. Uh, he's got, he's got a really proven, a long standing track record. He's played for two national championships, been to a lot of elite eights. I, I was actually covering a game in the NCAA tournament when he, his Louisville team upset Baylor. That was a Baylor dynasty with Brittany Griner and Kim Mulkey there. That was considered a super team. Uh, and Louisville beat that team. Just a tremendous game um, in the Sweet 16. And that really got my attention. And just his overall track record, uh, I just really like him as a coach. So he would be my number one. A home run hire, and I think it's it's very conceivable that he would take the job. Yeah, it's interesting, John. You mentioned that, like back in 2019, Jeff Walls was was darn near begging for an interview. I mean, he was talking about the job publicly um, <laughs> during the NCAA tournament. <laughs> it's really kind of eye opening. Uh, I remember he had one comment like, "No, I haven't been interviewed yet." Uh, almost like, "Please, Tennessee, <laughs> come come interview well, me." Well, <laughs> I, I, I think. I think Jeff Walls, and I think there are other coaches like this who are doing well wherever they are. And I think they see there's the ceiling is higher at Tennessee because of uh, what Pat Summit did there. And that, that still looms large with this program. I mean, Pat's been gone a long time now, uh, retired after the 11 12 season, and then. Uh, died in 2016, but it, when Tennessee was playing uh, NC State in that in that regional, uh, the commentators were still talking about Pat Summit, about all oh, the importance of rebounding and and defense. Pat Summit always stressed that, so people still know about Pat Summit, and I think people, I think other coaches look at this job in that light, and that's one reason why I think. Tennessee can hire a good coach and you talk about a home run hire corn uh knows the game right now what's going on at other schools better than I do so but there might be some really good coach out there that you think oh I don't know if she'd want to be the coach at Tennessee and yes she would mm -hmm. uh, you know so I think the key is to find that coach and make that connection Corey, your thoughts on on Jeff Walls and also your your first uh, swing big candidate? Yeah, I think to John's last point, I think it will be interesting with this search to see what kind of pull the Lady Vols brand and program still has. Because I think it's still like it's still a very attractive job to ninety five percent of coaches in America. I think there are very few coaches who wouldn't consider a call. I think there's very few coaches who you know, wouldn't consider an offer. Um, but I think Jeff Walls is an interesting, you know, swing big candidate, um, definitely has a great resume. I'm not sure how popular he would be among the fan base. Um, I'm also not sure how much that would impact Danny White's decision. Um, because at the end of the day, he's going to hire someone who wins, who has postseason success, or at least he should. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if Jeff Walls would be a super popular pick among the Tennessee fan base, just from the kind of temperature I've read on social media and what I've heard. Um, but my first big swing candidate, I didn't have her on my original hot board. Um, she was going to be on my second, but um, I think Brenda Freeze is a really interesting option just because she's had a really long track record of success, of, you know, every place she's coached. I mean, she's 639 and 191 in her career. So that's like a 77% win percentage. She's 42 and 17 in the NCAA tournament, um, has won a national championship, been to the final four, was a consensus coach of the year in 2021. Um, so I think it could be interesting to look at Freeze and if she would be interested, because um, she's also have, has a good track record with recruiting. Um, you know, she was at Maryland when they were in the ACC and the Big Ten and had success in both conferences. Um, so I think that could be interesting for sure. Um, and I think that she would be um, a, a well-received 
uh, candidate by the, the fan base. And I think it'd be good if they can to try to hire a woman and continue that streak. But obviously, like, they're looking at who's the best that they can get. So I'm not sure if Freeze is looking to leave Maryland, but I think she's an interesting candidate, um, especially if you're thinking about postseason success and sustained success over career. Yeah, certainly uh, someone who has the credentials lost in in the first round, I believe, this year, but uh, it was just a year ago that she had Maryland in the Elite Eight. You mentioned the multiple Final Fours. Uh, it's interesting we have Brenda Freeze so far and a Brenda Freeze disciple in Jeff Walls uh, highlighting her uh, uh, the, the list so far. So uh, I, I wonder if we'll hear more about Brenda Freeze later. John, your, your thoughts on Brenda Freeze? Uh, Brenda Freeze was on my list. Um, Brenda Freeze, it seems as though she's been coaching for so long she should be in her 70s. And she's not nearly that old. Um, and I don't know what her family situation is. Uh, I remember there was during an NCAA tournament, it seems like she had two, she had twins maybe or something. And that mm -hmm. was kind of a big story. One of the twins had some health issues. She's been at Maryland a long time. She, she seemed like a better candidate seven or eight years ago, but Sometimes coaches that, I mean, I don't remember what Maryland ba women's basketball was before Brenda Freeze went there. And so, I mean, maybe uh, a new job might invigorate her and maybe push her. And I think maybe she could recruit. Uh, she's a good, really good recruiter. Um, and that she could recruit better to Tennessee than she could at Maryland now. And maybe she's got transfers coming and going there. That's one of the things I know. It's a very seems to be a very volatile program, but it dis, doesn't seem to negatively impact the program. Programs players come in there, have success, uh, move, go somewhere else and have success. Uh, she just finds other players, and I think it's very important to be able to uh, assemble a new roster with transfers, particularly in Tennessee's case. So, yeah, I would consider that a home run hire. Yeah, and if uh, maybe the timing could be right too with uh, the Big Ten expanding, who knows? Maybe Brenda Freeze doesn't want to uh, make all these cross country flights to Southern Cal and UCLA and uh, Oregon on on down the line. I mean, I, I say it kind of jokingly, but seriously, like I, I think there ought to be a lot of Big Ten coaches considering, hey, do I want to be in this conference that's roughly the size of Europe? Uh, no joke. So, uh, my first uh, swing big candidate, if anyone read my column. Uh, this week, they probably know. Uh, I'm swinging big with with Lindsey Gottlieb, the Southern Cal coach, uh, former NBA assistant with with the Cleveland Cavaliers. Uh, she's been successful at every stop of her college coaching career. She was with the Cal Bears before she went to the NBA. Cal, you know, doesn't have the richest uh, women's basketball history, and she was a staple in the NCAA tournament there, um, and and has done really well at USC. We saw them just lose in the Elite Eight to uh, to UConn, but the list of coaches who have lost to Gino in the Elite Eight is quite lengthy, and there's some really good coaches on that list. So that doesn't doesn't uh, dissuade me from her. I did wonder, you know, I mean, she's got it humming really, really well at, at USC. She's got six ESPN Top 100 recruits lined up for next season. And of course, we all know about Juju Watkins and, and what she did this year set to return next year would any of them follow her to tennessee it could be tempting um and you know would she leave i don't know but if, i think to cora's point from earlier you don't fire kelly harper and then roll out someone with an inferior resume or, or with less momentum in their current program than uh than what kelly harper had i think lindsey gottlieb has more momentum going at, at southern cal undeniably than what tennessee had going and would she say that? Yes. Don't know. Don't know the answer to that unless, unless you ask her and make a very compelling offer to her. What do you guys think? Um, I, I agree. I think Lindsay's a really like interesting candidate just, and it would be absolutely a home run. Um, I think it's just a matter of, I wonder how, attached she is to the program it seems like she's pretty invested in that she's really built something there um especially with the recruiting class she has coming in so it would just be 
can she be bought? Because I think with, you know, if you float someone like Don Staley, I don't think Don, a, a check could be big enough from Tennessee for Don Staley to leave. Is that the same situation with Lindsey Gottlieb? I don't know. Um, possibly. Um, but it also to your point about the conference realignment, that I feel like that plays a part with every um, Power 5 coach outside the SEC, really, because um, if you look at, like, Oregon State, Washington State, they're joining the West Coast Conference. Okay, that's definitely a step down. And then Big Ten is now um, – and the ACC are – both coast conferences at this point. So I wonder how that impacts people's happiness and their current position. Yeah, and the other thing uh, I think about with Lindsay Gottlieb, maybe she's maybe this thought wouldn't enter her enter her mind, but I believe she is subject to a twelve percent state income tax in California, zero percent state income tax in Tennessee. And uh, never lived in LA, but I suspect, despite the fact that Knoxville is a booming place, probably still a little cheaper than uh, Los Angeles. So maybe I'm making Danny White's pitch for him. Well, Blake, I think there's so many people from California moving here to Knoxville. So she just joined a, joined a long list. Uh, yeah. My realtor, a realtor friend of mine talks quite a bit about all the California customers she has. So, and you're right about that. You're right about that price range. And you brought up those, uh, uh, cross country trips and travel. And I don't know how they're going to work that out in the big 10 in the newly aligned big 10, but I think Tennessee, and I don't know what she's making there, but I think Tennessee can pay is certainly pay, probably pay more than Southern Cal can. Yeah. If it wants to go big, Tennessee's gone cheap, want, and cheap yeah. and fast. And if you get some of those recruits to come along with her so much, so much the better. I mean, she could flip, she could flip the program uh, pretty fast. So yeah, that, that would, have that's another, that would be, and she's a hot name now. And she's, she's the coach who, ha, who recruited uh, Juju. So <laughs> that's in her favor as well. Cora. I do wonder with the recruiting point, obviously, you know, USC has, um, a healthy NIL backing behind it and Juju stayed home to go to USC. So I'm not sure, you know, Juju follows her and I'm not sure like, would you leave if Juju wouldn't follow you? I don't know. I mean, I feel like you wouldn't. Um, and you know, can Tennessee, you know, get the NIL money together for the next year's class? If she, you know, was thinking about leaving would they follow her i don't know because also knoxville is a great city but a lot of kids like la and that life and that atmosphere so and based on what they did this season with you know selling out home court like home games like i'm not sure recruits would be super willing to leave even though they, i'm sure they love Lindsay as a coach you know so i'm wondering if she didn't feel like the recruit to follow her, would that also, you know, impact? And I feel like when you have a generational player like Juju, it probably would. Yeah, that's a good point. John, you're, uh, your next big candidate. Okay. My next big candidate, I decided to go a little bit off the wall with this one. Uh, I got a little weird. Love okay. it. it. You could, you could call it a home run hire mm -hmm. or a possible strikeout hire. Okay. Mm -hmm. I know where this one's going. Candace Parker. There we she's have it. Look, she's a player. Okay. She's a former lady vol. Uh -huh. I mean, how much longer can she last in the day? She's a she's WNBA 38 legend. Soon. Turning yeah. 38 soon. She's got to be thinking about what's next. Yeah. Right? Well, you know, she's got to be looking at her next move. Um, also with Candace, I really like her as an analyst. I think she comes. Well, you're going to lose her as an analyst if you he hire her as the coach. Well, I, I know, but you know, she can. I can maybe call her up and ask her what she thinks about such and such a NBA game um, sure. or NCAA tournament men's game. And I just think she's very good. She's got a presence about her. She really knows the game. You can tell when she how she really knows the game. And so, as I said once before, when Kara Lawson and Kelly. Harper were the candidates. 
I like Carol Lawson more because she didn't have a track record. And I didn't know what her upside might be. So I'll do the same thing. I don't know. Would this constitute a home run hire hiring somebody that doesn't even coach? I think it constitutes hiring a, an NBA, a WNBA player. Yeah, I think that, that constitutes a home run. I mean, she's kind of a diva, I guess, but uh, she's certainly well known. And uh, certainly. Yeah. So, uh, and when was the last time Tennessee won a national championship? She was in the starting lineup. So that's my home run slash strikeout hire. I love it, Cora. I know you're dying to get in here. Your thoughts? I have so many thoughts. <laughs> um, I think, Eve, I, I just, for, from my perspective, from what I know about what Candace has said about, you know, potentially retiring and then coming back for this last season to play for the Aces, um, family is very important to her right now. And I don't think she has any interest in becoming a college coach when she has a two or three year old and like two very small children and Layla in high school um, because college coaching takes up your whole life. And I just don't think that that is even on her radar right now. Um, would she, she would be, you know, very celebrated by the fan base, of course. And obviously I'm sure she would be able to recruit. Um, and I have no doubt that she would be a good coach. Um, but I just, I don't think from her side, she would even be interested um, right now. And I think, yeah, I don't know. And I don't know if she'd want to, um, it's a risk. Like this is a big job. It's super intimidating. There is a lot of pressure. Um, and to be a player who you are the last one to win a national title here and you are kind of a legend in the program, like it's a risk to go in and be like, I'm going to be the head coach and lead them back to the mountaintop. What if that doesn't happen? Like yeah. that's a huge, you know, leap of faith on her end. Um, besides the fact that I don't really think she's interested in college coaching in general, especially at this point in her life, I, I could see it, you know, once her kids are older, but she's got two very young kids, Layla in high school. She literally went to Vegas and got paid way less just to be closer to her family. So like, I just, I don't know. I don't, <laughs> I, I think it's, I think it's an interesting person to bring up, but I think it's very unlikely. John, you took the assignment seriously. You were you were swinging swinging big well, here. I was I was swinging for the and see one thing about me, I have I don't have any problem with rejection. It doesn't phase me. So I could if Candace says no, it is to Cora's point. If she's yeah, family issues, doesn't want to move, still got a year, wants to play longer. Fine, okay. Hey, good talking to you, Candace. I'll move on. Okay. Yeah. What do you think about the Celtics game tonight? <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking about making a bet. Who do you like here? Right. All right, Corey, you're your next uh, big candidate. Sorry. Um, I had her at the top of my first hot board, and even though it's a super, super tough hire, I think you have to call her, um, and that is Neil Ivy at Notre Dame. Um, would be an absolute home run of a hire. I don't know if she'd ever leave Notre Dame because she played there and coached with Muffet McGraw for so long, but she has already established herself as one of the best co coaches in the country. Um, only four seasons into being a head coach, um, has won an ACC regular season championship, ACC tournament title, really, really strong recruiting track record as an assistant and already as a head coach, um, young, relatable, very, very popular uh but yeah, the the problem with that one is I'm not sure if she's someone who can be bought because you went there, you coach alongside the legend of your program, you already have built a very strong foundation for your own tenure there. It would it'd be very hard to hire her away, but she would absolutely be like Grand Slam uh, hire for this because she just, yeah, she's compelling, she's young, she's successful, so... Yeah, I like this one. Um, I, I, I think back to 2019 and think Tennessee could have been ahead of the game if they if they would have tapped Ivy in 2019 when this job came open before she was the coach at Notre Dame 
possible opportunity, well, definite opportunity miss there. I, I'm not, could they go back in time? Would they do it? Who knows? But uh, would probably have looked really, really good five years later. John, your your thoughts uh, on Ivy at Notre Dame? Oh, yeah. And I, I would go the same round with her as I would with my uh, home run slash strikeout uh, pick and Candace Parker. She says, no, okay, hey, best of luck to you. See you, in, see you at the final four. But she'd be a great hire. And one of the things about her, too, is there wasn't a big deal made about it because she's she was already on staff. And, and I, I thought Muffet McGraw was a great coach. I love what she did at Notre Dame and uh, just really good representative of a program. She wins. She's good with the media, good promoter. And so you have, she was following a legend there at Notre Dame. And, and that's not much import placed on that because she was already there, but still she's following a great coach. And I wondered about that hire at the time. I didn't know that much about her. She had a good reputation as a recruiter, uh, but she's done really well. She's she's fit in perfectly there and continued. You should continue the success. You don't see that happen that often. That that's an exception. What happened there? So yeah, that would be a great yeah. If you could hire her, go for it. John, I know you got to run for an important interview here. So Cor and I are going to wrap up the pod here in a moment, but I want to get your final candidate. We've heard your, uh, your two swing bigs, Jeff Walls and Candace Parker. Now, how about more the the double into the gap, if you will, if, uh, if you're striking out on your swings for the fences? Well, see, I'm confident I won't strike out. Oh, of course. Uh, I mean, I just, you know, that's not an option for me. Well, I think so, if you started with Jeff Walls, you're not going to strike strike out. I agree with you okay. there. Okay. Well, I mean, all, I like all the candidates you guys have represented. I think surely uh, presented. I think surely Tennessee can get one of them. It's not going to strike out on all of them. Uh, maybe on Candace, but uh, not all the others, and and maybe not on on Ivy. And this was uh, I don't know much about this coach. But I know somebody who knows a lot about SEC basketball, and he highly recommends Sam Purcell in Mississippi State. Ooh, that's uh, and, and I don't think there's any doubt he'd take the job. Why would he not take the job? I did like when I saw them play the way he uh, he interacted uh, with his players. The players seemed to play hard for him. He's uh, they seemed very motivated. So. Uh, yeah, he didn't, uh, but we're talking fall back here. I'm not planning on falling back. I don't go into this saying, man, I sure do want to fall back in this coaching search. So, okay. um, uh, that, that would be my fallback candidate. All right. Sam Purcell, Mississippi state, a, a Jeff walls, uh, disciple, I believe. So we have walls who's I, a Bernie Freeze we, disciple Purcell. Who's a walls disciple. We're just uh, running through the coaching trees here. Why, why not just hire Brenda freeze and get, and pay those uh, two head coaches enough to be in their assistance too. I'll give them all a couple of million a year and then bring back the band. Yeah. Put it back together. Uh, John, I know you got to run. Thanks for your, for your ideas. Uh, Cora, you're I'm curious what you think. You're the, uh, the, the expert here. What's your thoughts on John inserting Sam Purcell? I think it's interesting. I think he wouldn't probably be on my list just because like he's so early in his coaching career and you kind of have to wonder about the way they ended this season. Um, they brought back some really good pieces. They had some pretty good freshmen come in some solid portal kids and they started off. Well, they didn't have a great non-con um, pretty weak schedule in my opinion. Um, so they, they were winning games. Uh, they lost a few when they had players out um, started up SEC play all right, had a big win over LSU, and then everything kind of just went downhill from there. Um, and it was really kind of confusing because they have a great center in Jessica Carter. They have a great guard in Je and, um, Jaquela Jordan. So they should have been more successful than they were, and it, and it just didn't come together, which is also kind of the nature with sometimes portal teams. Um, but, I mean – you can't not love his personality as a coach. Um, I think he's made really good impressions across the SEC, and, and I have no doubt that he's going to um, find some success at Mississippi State for sure. Um, I just think for me it's a little early for that, especially the way they ended this season. 
Yeah, I might rather have the other coach in Mississippi as my fallback option if if the swing bigs didn't didn't work out and, and Coach Yo uh, and what what she's doing at at Ole Miss. I kind of like both of them, but uh, if I if I had to turn to one as as a so called fallback, I would I would probably go with uh, Yo before I would go with with Purcell. So uh, I'm going to throw out my final two, and then then we'll end with uh, your final one, Cora. Um, but uh, my final swing big, I also teased this one in my column, this would be an awfully, awfully swing big. Becky Hammond coaching in the WNBA, longtime NBA assistant with Greg Popovich, um, has interviewed for multiple NBA coaching jobs, uh, played professionally in Tennessee with Tennessee Fury way back when. If she's getting tired of waiting on the NBA and wants a change out of the W, Cut her a fat check. See if she wants to coach the college game. Hasn't shown interest in that before. I believe she turned down the Florida job. It was reported a few years ago. Um, so there's not really any ind- indication that maybe she would jump at this. But if we're talking swing big, uh, I'm I'm inserting Becky Hammond into the conversation. And then uh, my fallback is actually where John started the conversation. Uh, I think Jeff Walls qualifies as a swing big, but I don't want to fall back too far. And knowing how desperately Jeff Walls wanted an interview five years ago, maybe he's changed on that. Maybe maybe he's no longer interested in Tennessee, but I'm putting him under the heading of fallback option because if he wanted that interview so bad five years ago, uh, who says he doesn't want, a jo- want the job now, especially coming off a first-round exit with Louisville, if ever there was a time for him to restart his career elsewhere. I think this could, could be it, and I wonder if he's still interested five years later. So your thoughts on, on and you, we've already discussed walls, but uh, your thoughts on my final two core. Um, Becky's an interesting name. I think even though she's like had so much success in the pros, I still think there's an inherent risk when you hire somebody who doesn't have experience coaching women's basketball and recruiting in women's basketball. Like it is both are so difficult in different ways like the pros you're, you know, building a roster with only 12 spots and this much money. And like, there's all, you know, it's a way different kind of recruiting players to your team. Um, Not that I don't think that she would do well, but I do still think like there is an inherent risk there of like for her too, included like leaving somewhere she's so successful to dive into something that is way different um, and probably takes up way more of her time um, than the WNBA, which plays, you know, for th- the summer and spring, as opposed to college, which is going to be year round every single day of your life, basically. Um, I also, I also think that um, she would get a, a counter offer that would outmatch Tennessee to stay at the Aces, given their run with her. I don't think that they're going to let her go uh, very easily. And I'm not sure that, you know, again, I don't know if she's shown much interest in going to back to the college level or not back to, but going to it initially. Um, my fallback would be Jara Payne at Colorado. Um, it's, it's kind of a risk because her first five seasons there weren't super impressive, but the last three have been really strong seasons that she's put together. Um, been to the sweet 16 um, for the last two years and is from Jackson, Tennessee, if they want a Tennessee connection, even though it's not lady balls, but you know, having a Tennessee native might be attractive to um, the administration just for that kind of connection. Um, but she's done well developing players and building a team into, you know, a, a favorite for a postseason run for most of the season. Um, they kind of fell off towards the end of Pac-12 play, which was a brutal conference this year. Um, and they kind of, they kind of got, and it hurt their seeding, which matched them up with Iowa in the Sweet 16, which is really tough, you know, sell with the way Kaylin Clark is playing. So I think if maybe they had gotten different draw, maybe they make it to the Elite Eight this year or farther, who knows. Um, But I think she's an an intriguing candidate just because of recent success. And you have to wonder what she could do with the resources at Tennessee and, um, you know, that kind of brand power and and, and NIL money behind her. Um, But yeah, I I think that's kind of my, my fallback option here. 
Yeah, she's an interesting one because, uh, as you said, like they, they were really patient with her at, at Colorado in the first several years of her tenure, and, and it's paid off. Um, so good good for them. She wouldn't get that kind of patience at, at Tennessee. It would be a much more demanding job than she's ever had, obviously, coaching the Lady Vols versus um, Colorado women. I mean, it's, it's really kind of night and day. But as you said, you look through the lens of the last couple seasons, back-to-back sweet 16s. Uh, I wonder, you know, as you said, kind of in the open, trying to sell it to the fan base of we hired someone better than Kelly Harper when her high water mark is a sweet 16, same as what Kelly's high water mark was at, at Tennessee. Um, I think you have to sell this one on, Hey, she beat Kim, Kim Mulkey to start the season. Right. It's, is maybe that, maybe that's your, maybe that's the sell of uh, how this, this could be a, a bright future. Yeah, no, I think it's definitely kind of an outlier. Like I, I, I think, She's a solid option, but in terms of this coaching search, I think they got to swing bigger. But she's definitely a solid coach, and with the re- conference realignment, she might probably is looking. You know, if she had a better option, would take it. Final thing, Cora, as we record this on a Wednesday afternoon, you are in Cleveland to cover the uh, the women's Final Four and uh, national championship. Um, but you know, we know. The search started officially on on Monday um, with Danny White's decision uh, to move on from from Kelly Harper. Do you get any sense for sort of rough timeline when Tennessee may be able to to wrap this search up? Do you think it could happen maybe even before the national championship game on Sunday? Um, I think they definitely have to move quickly just because the transfer portal window has been open for immediate eligibility for a few weeks. Um, There are some bigger names starting to enter this week, and this team is going to need, you know, good players out of the portal to make an immediate impact next season. So I think you have to move quickly. Um, There's also evaluation periods coming up for high school recruits um, near the end of the month. So getting someone in quickly as possible um, is ideal, especially for that coach's sake um, of getting a good start. And, there are, were reports that, you know, they were already conducting interviews in Atlanta this week. So I could realistically see someone being in like getting an offer and getting paperwork done by the end of the weekend. But I don't know if they'd announce it or want to announce it till after the national championship. So I could see someone being in place by early next week. Um, because also this wasn't just a move that they made on Monday. Mm-hmm. You know, they've clearly been considering it. And if you were, I'm sure you're sending out feelers, you're know, trying to gauge interest. You have probably candidates in mind you really, really want that you could hit the ground running with immediately. So I would imagine it's going to happen pretty quickly. All right. You can find all of Cora's coverage of the coaching search and also the final four over on knoxnews.com. John's got some commentary. I do as well. And uh, when a hire is announced, we'll try to get Cora back. Uh, to discuss the direction Tennessee went with this hire. Uh, Thanks for listening to this edition of the Volunteer State.